Uh, but welcome and, and thanks for joining us to talk today about quantitative systems pharmacology using Julia. My name is Matt Bauman. I am the Director of Applications Engineering at Julia Computing. and have been working with the Julia language for uh, nearly seven years now. Uh, I've been a part of the Julia Computing team for three and, and working with QSP uh, for the past year. It's been a great journey, a, a lot of fun to work with and, and a really great place where I think Julia can particularly shine uh, in, in what it can do and, and how it works. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to you all about that today. Uh, I'm going to pull up uh, let me just pull up the chat session here. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. If it's appropriate to address at that time, I'll try to address it right away. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some time towards the end for an extended Q&A session uh, to talk about you know, how QSP works in Julie and, and how this might look like in your own environment. Uh, so to start the discussion today, I think uh, it's nice to talk a little bit about why Julia, right? Why this new language? Why do you want to use Julia? Why is it uh, a compelling answer, particularly in QSP? Well, one great answer here is that it's an expressive language. Uh, and so it's uh, almost like a pseudocode for math in some ways. You can take a textbook algorithm, match it with its implementation in Julia very nicely, uh, including you know nice Unicode characters to match the literature uh, as you would want it to, to look like. Uh, and it's uh, pretty straightforward to uh, code up, for example, a differential equations model within Julia. Uh, this in particular here is a Gillespie model, a Gillespie simulation, doing a, a standard uh, survival infected uh, recovered population analysis. Um, and it's really straightforward, right? We're just defining the, you know, how each variable gets updated at each step. Uh, and then you can, can run the model very easily. So it's a, a very straightforward translation from algorithm to implementation to results, allowing you to, to do this easily uh, and directly uh, with a very straightforward translation. At the same time, it's fast, right? Uh, so as compared to other implementations, uh, you know, the naive Gillespie package here, which is written in pure Julia code, the, the first scratch at it here, I uh, had a performance that far and away beat the R package, uh, the Gillespie SSA package. Uh, you know, being able to do a simulation in just four milliseconds, uh, as opposed to nearly a thousand milliseconds. If you do the, the pure R thing, well, it's even longer. Um, if you take the effort to translate things into a totally different language, use RCPP, to, to connect to it, to, to write things actually in C++ instead of R, well, then you can, can get the speeds that you want here, right, with uh, down to around a millisecond per simulation. The beautiful thing about Julia is that in order to optimize it, you don't need to, uh, to throw away all that you had. It's just a few little annotations, a few tricks and tips that allow you to optimize things down. And in fact, can allow you to beat the traditional compiled languages uh, and, and get even faster than R. So this allows you to you know, get results where the straightforward use of just kind of the open source package uh, gets you you know, 225 times faster. Adding a few simple optimizations gets you up to 500 times faster. And, you know, doing the native thing, it can even beat the, the second language approach. Uh, and so historically, you've kind of needed two languages, right? You've needed this two different languages. You have your, your scientists working in one language who hand it off to expert programmers who re-implement it into another language that gives you the, the speed that you need in order to make productionalize it and you know, get the, the number of simulations you need in, within a reasonable amount of time. Julia allows you to do this all within one language. Uh, and so this one-two punch of being fast and expressive is a, a very uh, 
common thing that folks throughout see this uh, from from academia with this uh, nature paper last year entitled come for the syntax stay for the speed i often think it's the other way around folks see our speed and and see that that's compelling uh, and then realize oh hey this is also a really nice language to work with it's also a really nice syntax to work with uh, and so they stay for the syntax but even in, in industry, folks are seeing uh, Julia as a great solution. Uh, Jeff Dean, for example, is the co-founder and leader of Google's deep learning research and engineering team. He's seen what we've been able to do with Julia as being fast and expressible uh, uh, for machine learning, which is his specialty. Uh, but it also applies to QSP. Um, and one of the, the things that makes Julia particularly compelling for QSP is indeed its differential equations ecosystem. Uh, and so this is a, a very complicated uh, and, and busy slide, um, but it is far and away the, the most comprehensive and best way to kind of get a sense of how thorough and, uh, and well established the Julia differential equation ecosystem is. And so the way to read this slide is that each column here is a, uh, let's see, can I do a laser pointer here? Each uh, column here, is a particular ecosystem, a particular differential equation solver ecosystem. So for example, this first column is MATLAB, second column is SciPy, R is DSolve, and then the fourth column here is Julia's, and so on and so forth. Each row is a particular aspect or a particular feature that you might want. Uh, and they're graded on a scale here from you know, that feature being totally non-existent uh, to being excellent, which means that not only does that feature exist, but it's fully supported. It has all the optimizations that you would want. It has all the ways that you can tweak it, are you flexible, uh, allows you to do lots of fun things with it. Uh, and so, for example, MATLAB here is really good at complex numbers, right? They, they have really good built-in support for complex numbers. And I would hope so because the core, you know, data structure in MATLAB is arrays of complex numbers. That's kind of their bread and butter. Differential equations has you know really excellent support all throughout the board across all of these things. Uh, and one of the ways in which you know we're able to test these and, and get them on really good grounding is that Julia itself has extraordinarily good interoperability. Uh, and so not only does the Julia differential equations ecosystem you know have the pure Julia solutions, but it also has interconnects into effectively all of these other ecosystems uh, that allow you to benchmark them against each other, allow you to compare their results at a numerical stability level, allow you to, to see how, how easily it is to tweak them. And, and so Julia is almost in, in some ways a superset uh, of all of these things. So the way in which this happened is precisely because of that one-two punch of expressive and fast language. Because it's only in uh, one high level language that allows you to write fast code, the, the lead author of differential equations was able to, in relatively short order, you know, grab every single algorithm that's uh, ever been uh, implemented or proposed or white papered or published uh, for solving differential equations uh, and, and immediately implement it in Julia and wire it up into this very extensible stack that he's now built. Now, he is an extraordinary developer, to be sure, but he's also built, brought along with him a, a huge community of developers that have then also begun working on this task as well. And so, whereas, you know, for example, Sundials, the, you know, very classic C++ and Fortran set of solvers, has a fairly limited set of, of solvers that you can throw at any one problem. Uh, Julia's differential equations has over 300. And even more powerful is that we're able to automatically figure out which solver will turn away the best at your problem or do a good job at your particular problem. And you can further tweak things as you gain more understanding of how stiff it is, for example, or, or, or how complicated it is. You can play around with these things. Uh, and so we're able to not just stand on the shoulders of giants, but then also see what, what new giants are, are around and, and what new things are, are being proposed from literature 
uh, and implement these things, these, these uh, research papers that effectively had been abandoned because they never got coded up into C++ or Fortran, just because it's a pain to do, whereas it's very easy to do in Julia. So that brings us to QSP, right? Uh, QSP is all about, you know, building up very large differential equations models uh, and, and doing large samples, large simulations, potentially virtual populations, gaining understanding of the, uh, of the population on, as, as nicely expressed in this uh, six stage workflow uh, that was published um, and, back in, in 2016 and you know Julia is able to support all six stages here very very easily um, so not only do we have the differential equations ecosystem we also have really nice uh, data frames ecosystem uh, that steals quite a number of ideas from ours data frames uh, including the name uh, but also you know brings along with it some nicer ways of working and some more efficient ways of working so the whole way from information collection to ETL to transformation to building of models simulation of models uh, you know studying the results building up a study design uh, and, and back again uh, Julie is able to to be one language that allows you to do this We've done this across lots of large name uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. In fact, we're working with five of the top 10 pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies as of today. One example uh, that I can share with you is you know, what we've done with Pfizer's QSP team, uh, where we've seen, you know, they, they came to us with three MATLAB uh, models. Um, where they had asked, hey, can we, can we speed these up? What does this look like in Julia? How does this work? Um, so these first two rows here uh, are the results from a, a very s simple and straightforward cardiac model. Um, and this is a model that they had implemented in, in pure MATLAB code, hadn't done too much work on optimizing it beyond the, the basic MATLAB optimizations that you would would expect to, to be done. We were able to translate this to Julia. It's a very straightforward translation. In fact, Julia looks a lot like MATLAB, only with square brackets for indexing instead of curly brackets. Um, and the ability to define your own functions uh, anywhere you want. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, the ability to use for loops. Uh, and you don't need to be scared of for loops anymore. For loops are indeed fast in Julia. Uh, so whereas, if you're a, a classic MATLAB or R programmer, you may have had for loops beaten out of you. They're, they're no longer need to be feared. Uh, you can, can use for loops to your heart's delight. Um, and so what this means is that, you know, we're able to, to define this very straightforwardly in Julia, translate this over into Julia pretty easily uh, and see a very nice speed up, right? We're able to get a 26 fold speed up here just over the single core and of course, What's really nice about Julia is it, it's very easy to parallelize. Um, MATLAB, in some cases, you can just throw a PMAP on it. And Julia kind of takes that concept and runs with it and makes it even easier to, to parallelize many, many cases just by, you know, essentially flipping one switch uh, as you parallelize it. It's just a matter of flipping one switch and saying, hey, I want to use multiple threads instead of a single thread, or I want to use multiple machines instead of a single machine, or hey, I want to use a GPU processor instead of uh, my CPUs, or potentially even a, a, a suite, a whole cluster of computers, each with a GPU processor attached to it. Uh, you can do this uh, and get things going. So we can see very large speed ups just by changing one sim simple flag. Um, the bottom three rows here is a virtual population analysis. Uh, oops, I guess bottom two rows, I mislabeled this here, sorry. The bottom two, lows, two uh, rows here is a virtual population analysis for their Pfizer's published Tawari Beard model. Um, and you know, here they've done a lot of work to uh, to to optimize their code, uh, in fact, including you know rewriting it into C, and and they're even there we're able to you know gain a nice speed up of twofold per CPU, uh, and again nicely scalable. The one that I want to talk more about are these three middle rows here. Uh, I should have 
colored this green as well. This is what, what we're calling the leucine model. Uh, and it's actually an active drug target, so I can't talk too terribly much about it. Um, but it allows, you know, we can, I can talk about it at a surface level. We were able to get a really nice speed up. And this is a production model that they were seeing huge bottlenecks on getting the, the virtual population analysis running in a sufficient amount of time to get the population that they wanted to get this study done. Um, and so this is something where, you know, they had implemented this in MATLAB recoded into C with Sundial's binding. So hitting the, what had been the best in class uh, differential equation solvers. And they really weren't doing anything wrong there. In fact, they had really nice optimal code. Um, and yet we were still able to see a speed up because we had implemented a slightly smarter differential equation solver. Uh, and so we were able to get a sevenfold speed up uh, just comparing so serial to serial. Uh, and the sevenfold speed up happened because the, the solver itself was smarter. Uh, in particular, in this case, it was smarter at responding to a bolus drug input, right? So classic QSB case is you have a drug input that is periodic and has a huge discontinuity, right? It's a bolus input, uh, say, one dose every six hours or something along those lines. Well, the differential equations uh, with a naive differential equation solver, it needs to throw away all the history once it gets that discontinuity and, and needs to start building up a new uh, understanding of the, of the system. But that's not entirely true, right? If you have a smarter solver, well, then you can not throw away that, limit your sampling, uh, gain a better understanding of the system and how it responds to bolus inputs, and in particular repeated bolus inputs, uh, and gain a huge speed up there just by sampling a little bit less and being a little bit smarter about how you're doing your sampling. Uh, so this is you know, how you can, can see this. Um, and again, with just changing one, one line of code, you can change it to be multi-CPU, multi-GPU, uh, and we, you can get really nice linear scaling because this was a virtual population analysis. Each population is independent or each person in the population is independent. Uh, and so that means that you can split this across, you know, potentially many thousands of workers uh, and, and getting things going nicely and easily and get really nice linear scaling. And, and the, the height of this bar is really just limited by how large of a population you have and how many workers you have at your fingertips. So this parallelism is, is very simple and easy to do and allows you to scale to kind of the, the amount of hardware you have available to you. A little bit more about this model. Um, it was, you know, 14 ODEs fitting 56 parameters. Um, and because this was a, an active drug target, they had done a lot of work trying to optimize it, right? They took their MATLAB code that their, their scientists were working on, had, had an expert coder translated into C with the, the sundials bindings. Uh, and this imposed a huge workflow challenge, right? Uh, each modification that you made to your ODE as you're iterating on this required you to work with someone else who knew C and MATLAB, compile it into, you know, translate it over to C, recompile it. And there's a huge computational cost. There's other workflow challenges here, right? That, uh, you know, when you have compiled C code, it's highly tied to the architecture that you run on. I, and you know it's uh, challenging to, to recompile. The um, even more challenging is that now you have two sources of truth, right? You have the, the source of truth that your scientists are working on, the source of truth that your engineers are working on, and they might diverge. And in fact, this happened when we started working with this collaboration here. The MATLAB code and C code were indeed different. And so we had to go back to them and say, hey, which one's actually correct? Uh, and that's one of the things with uh, having translations and two sources of truth. It, it can be challenging to know where the provenance is, right? Um, and uh, of course, all the things with you know binary code being very tied to a particular operating system and a particular thing. Uh, if you want to deploy onto a cluster, might have a different operating system. Uh, it becomes challenging just to do benchmarking, let alone real work. So Julia combines 
both the efficiency of C and the productivity of MATLAB just in one language. So we, you know, even you can still have expert programmers who know maybe a little bit more about optimization, can help guide scientists in doing this, but the code that they end up with, the scientists can read and vice versa. It's uh, very helpful in improving your productivity. So with that, I, I think that's enough talk about this. Let's just show you all how this looks and the way this works. Um, so let's dive in to uh, you know the code here. Let me open up the leucine model. So this is the code itself here, uh, and the way it, it works. You know we're uh, we are indeed just doing a pmap here to to get this to run across all the subjects. Uh, and we simply say, you know, how many subjects are we going to run? Uh, how, how, uh, and what function are we going to use to build them? Uh, and that's just something that we define ourselves and it's doing an optimization across these 56 parameters. Now what's really cool is I can, you know, easily change the, uh, the amount of subjects that I want to to work on. So I could run this locally, for example, say, you know, maybe just with, you know, one or two subjects, run this locally, you know, get this up and running uh, locally on, on my own computer um, and run this, you know, very simply and easily make sure that it all works. Once I have it all working, well, then I can scale up, right? I can say, hey, let's do 120 subjects. Let's not do a thousand iterations of the optimization, but maybe do a million iterations here. I, I can easily get this going. And so let's build up a, a, a suite of, um, of subjects here. Now, again, remember, this is highly parallelizable. Uh, and so if I had 120 computers at my fingertips, well, I could split out this work where each computer just does one subject's work at a time. Uh, and the total amount of, of compute time that that would take would be effectively the same as doing them all on the same computer, right? You're, you're effectively doing the same work. It's uh, highly parallelizable. We're not doing any global optimization in this case. Uh, and so we can kind of expand this out to our heart's content. I'm just on my own laptop though, which only has six cores. So the, you know, the amount of parallelism I have at my fingertips on my local laptop is fairly limited. That said, I have access to what we call Julia Hub, uh, which is our compute in the cloud resource that allows me to connect to a cluster in the cloud. Uh, and this is actually using AWS's architecture to, to spin things up and, and get things going very quickly and easily. So here you can see that, uh, you know, my editor here automatically identified, you know, exactly what I'm going to be running. The um, this this main script here that that goes through in the source code of this of this package here. If I just go out here, um, in the source code is the actual definition of the uh, of the differential equations themselves, and it's all built together right here. So this is how you can build up your own. Uh, source and your own, uh, yeah, the way that you can can build your your models like this. It's very simple and straightforward. I unfortunately can't show this to you, at least not yet. Hopefully, it'll be out of embargo shortly. Um, but that's how this is working, right? And we just include that up. And my editor knows exactly what dependencies I'm using, exactly you know what local code I'm using, and he'll bundle it all up and deploy it into a cluster on the cloud. And I can just define that cluster easily and simply here. So we can say, hey, let's use four cores uh, each and let's have each machine will have four cores. And we can spin up say uh, 20 machines uh, each with four cores. And if we have a process per core, that gives me 80 workers that can churn on this, uh, churn away on this problem and get things going. And you can see this is actually fairly reasonable cost, right? It's, you know, 13 bucks an hour to spin up 20 machines in the cloud. Uh, and again, it's the same cost if I were to do it just one node, right? It would take 20 times longer potentially to do this. Um, but the, the multiplicative, multiplicative effect here is the, effectively the same. So let's do actually 15 nodes times four will give me 60 workers 
uh, and we're doing 120 subjects. So each worker should tackle about two, uh, two subjects and we'll map it across there. And we can just hit start job here. Uh, and that will bundle everything up, get things going. You can see a few other details in this, this panel here, this kind of cluster configuration panel. Uh, I could potentially say, hey, let's make sure that each machine in the cloud also has a GPU attached to it. So that's how you can get GPU compute at your fingertips as well. Makes it very simple and easy to, to play with GPU compute, even if you don't have one on your own local computer. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So right now I'm, I'm starting this job there. It just submitted it. You can see its results down here at the bottom. Uh, so here we just submitted this job uh, and you can go in and watch its logs go live as it spins up all those workers, gets them going. Right now it's just booting up the workers in the cloud, you know, making them up, uh, spinning them up on demand. So it'll take a little bit to go uh, to, to get them going. And, and this computation actually takes about 16 hours to run. Um, if I were doing it on a single core across, of course, by parallelizing it, I can get it down to about an hour to complete, which is really, really cool. Um, and I, here, I, just like any good baking show, I have the completed, the baked version already done here. So you can see you know what this looks looks like um, when when we did this before. So we have uh, the logs of a completed version here, uh, ready for you to inspect and understand. Dig into exactly you know what they're doing and how they're working. Uh, so that'll go out and download all the logs. Uh, one of the really cool things that we just implemented and, and is a lot of fun is that. You can actually have live plotting of your, your simulation as time goes on. Uh, so I'm not sure, not really set this up to, yeah, this, uh, this particular uh, example doesn't have any plottable results set up. I need to, to uh, change the code a little bit to make that work, but it's really nice and easy to, to get uh, incremental plots going live as your job is running allows you to, to kind of inspect what's going on very, very easily. Um, but then you can also just download the results. So here, this is a, a CSV of all my population. And you can see here, you know, the goodness of fit, all of these 56 parameters, uh, just as a CSV file that I can then import uh, and, uh, you know, use just do the kind of post analyses that I want to do very, very easily and, and simply, you know, use Julia to plot these results out, see what the virtual population is doing, see if there are any outliers, dig into the results, uh, make sure that they're all fitting nicely and easily. Um, so this all together makes for a really nice ecosystem, a really nice way for you to, to build your work. Uh, this, this file can be run on my own computer or it can be run in the cloud and I'll get exactly the same results either way. Even though my computer is on a Mac and the cloud is on a Linux, you can even get bit wise down to the last bit uh, exact identical results if you have the random number generators seated the same way. You can get exactly the same results, um, which is, uh, shockingly enough, something that's challenging to do, uh, especially when you start talking about cross-platform. So if you've ever tried to do replicability studies or, um, you know, understanding of that, then it's a challenge between platforms um, because the things get built differently, binary dependencies get built differently, uh, things like that. So this is how, uh, how you can get this going. So, if I were to do this uh, with R on the same cluster, I, uh, we've not done, you know, coded this up in R. Uh, this was a translation uh, from MATLAB code. Uh, and so in general, uh, I've found that R and MATLAB are somewhat comparable in their speeds. Um, and that is, you know, in this particular case, the MATLAB code was translated into C and then we were comparing against that. Uh, the equivalent case would be you take your R code, you use RCPP to translate it into C++, and then that would be the, the comparable thing. So even there, uh, you know, we're still able to beat it because of the better algorithms that we have uh, for solving differential equations. Um, but in general, at a high level, you know, R 
is a dynamic language uh, whose for loops aren't fast uh, and can be a little bit more challenging to parallelize. Uh, and, and in particular, more challenging to run on GPU. Um, and so uh, in cases like that, you can see 10 to 100 times speed, speed up uh, in many cases over pure R code. Even more than that, if, if you can get it running on GPU, but not all differential equations problems are amenable to GPU compute. It's kind of a constrained environment that makes it a little bit more challenging. But that's a good question. <laughs> so that's my demo. The last things that I want to talk about here are um, how Julia's packages are indeed geared for doing reproducible science. Uh, one way in which this manifests itself is through the way that we track dependencies and the way that we do this in a cross-platform manner. Uh, and so for example, for this leucine model, we have this auto-generated project file that tracks our top level dependencies. Uh, and so here you can see that our leucine model, um, it depends upon these three, just three packages at the top level, right? The linear algebra standard library, a modeling toolkit to define the models themselves, and then the ordinary differential equation solvers. Uh, and so these dependencies are all automatically generated in terms of how they, they um, you know, what, what goes in these three dots here is just a hash that identifies them. And then that gets matched up with a completely auto-generated manifest file that is a lot of gibberish, but what it's doing is it's grabbing out, you know, all of these top level dependencies, figuring out what their dependencies are, the second order, third order, fourth order dependencies, the whole way down, grabbing their exact version, their exact code hash, so it'd be an exact representation of the code itself, the exact version and the understanding of where this lives, how you get it, uh, you know, making sure that you can install it. And so when you have these two files with your project, then anybody can take that and, you know, get exactly the same results that you got. Uh, and this allows you to make sure that, that your results are reproducible. Uh, you check this into a, a version control system, for example, and, and then it's locked in and, and that's where your results came from. That's great for doing science. Finally, I want to note that Julia Hub itself uh, is available for enterprise use. So Julia Hub, why don't I just pop out to the, um, to the juliahub.com website here. Um, one second. So this is Julia Hub. Uh, and it is kind of your center point for the Julia ecosystem, as well as now cloud compute. Uh, and so the, the demo that I showed, it's available now to a few early, uh, early adopters. You can get notified to join that, that cohort of early adopters. And it's just, you know, using, uh, you know, individual credit card information to, uh, for the billing and such. And so it's great for individuals to play around and, and get a sense of this. But you can see here, that you know all of the the packages are here that you want. So, for example, you can dig into all the differential equations packages, uh, and there are twenty six packages tagged differential equations, from differential equations itself to a scientific machine learning package uh, called uh, DiffEQ Flux that allows you to combine neural networks with differential equations for a whole new class of of scientific machine learning. Lots of great ways to explore and understand the package ecosystem here. You can even go in and search through the documentation. So, you know, we can go in and, and look for, for example, Gillespie um, and, you know, gain an understanding of how could I do this myself? You, you can do this just in pure differential equations, right? Uh, there's an example of just coding up the Gillespie equations yourself. You can also use the Gillespie package. Uh, and, and playing around with that. So it's a lot of, a lot of fun to explore the ecosystem this way. A uh, qu good question about, you know, how uh, Julia has been used for genome sequencing or how this works. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's a lot of really cool uh, work for, for genomes and, and DNA uh, organized through the BioJulia organization. Uh, and one of the very powerful things that uh, we have in Julia is the ability to 
create your own vector types so that it can be extraordinarily efficient and high performance. And so, you know, you look for genome and up pops this thing called RLE vectors, which is like, why is genome coming up in RLE vectors? Well, these are run length encoded vectors that is a highly optimized version of Julia's own vector type, the, the one dimensional array that works extraordinarily well for DNA sequences. Uh, and so that's, that's why RLE vectors come up when you look for genome. But there's a lot of really great packages here, uh, including graphs and maps across genomic. Uh, I, I'm not as well versed uh, in this domain, but uh, you, know, you can, can take this and run just searching through the ecosystem documentation to find what all is available and what's out there. Uh, another question about, you know, those project and manifest files. Uh, do they get created for code written in a Jupyter environment? So Jupyter is, is the notebook environment. And in fact, Jupyter's name comes partially from Julia. The J-U and Jupyter comes from Julia. And then Python and R are the other two languages that are kind of first movers within the Julia, Jupyter uh, ecosystem. Uh, and yes, package and manifest files work just great. All you need to do is make sure that those are within the same uh, folder as your Jupyter notebook, uh, and it'll automatically pick those up and use that reproducibly. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to the other two questions in just a second. Um, I want to wrap up talking a little bit about Julia Hub, and then we'll come back to those packages. So here you can see this run code section shows me where all of these um, these things that I've run in the past are. So you can see this job that I just submitted here, and indeed we can pull up the lo live logs here online as well as within my IDE. Uh, looks like we're still spinning up the nodes. We're, we're pulling you know lots of nodes here, so. Um, Hopefully it'll come through shortly. Um, but yes, I, you can play with this uh, in lots of different ways here. Um, and you can look at you know existing uh, results as well. So here's uh, another log that, that I had completed and such. So that's what Julia Hub is. Uh, and indeed we have this set up for you know you to, to use within your own enterprise. Uh, and so we have an on-prem version of Julia Hub that can be your central point for packages, uh, not just the open source packages, but any packages that you or anyone in your organization builds and, and helps you manage those private packages, allows folks to add and, and use those packages just as easily as you do uh, your own open source packages. It also can help you proxy the open source packages behind a firewall and even within an air-gapped network. Um, gives you the governance and security that makes IT teams feel happy and, and secure, the legal teams happy with, by making sure that, for example, all the open source licenses are, are approved within your organization. And you know, if you're not behind an air gap, you can even deploy into your own AWS cloud account uh, or subnet or, or you know, in, internal network um, and you can get this set up. So it does the billing not against your credit card, but against your, your corporate uh, billing and, and takes care of that side of things for you. So this is where we see the future of running Julia at scale in the cloud. Uh, it makes it uh, as simple as possible. You know, this is just a little bit more about how that all works. Um, and effectively what it does is it brings all the public packages and the private packages within your firewall, within your, your, uh, your network and makes it just as easy to, to grab private packages as it does public packages. And then yes, you can deploy to that HPC environment. In some cases we can even target on-prem uh, HPC clusters uh, and we're working on improving that as, as time goes on. So with that, I'll, I'll bring my session to a close and then we can jump out to, to Q&A, more Q&A. Uh, we at Julia Computing are here to help support the open source ecosystem. We are founded by the creators of the Julia language itself. So Julia, the Julia language was released in 2012 to the public. Uh, and you know, within three years, the, the founders of the language had folks pounding down their doors saying, hey, we need enterprise support. We need a team that we can you know, be sure will be there, uh, make sure that the language succeeds, make sure that uh, there's a home, uh, and perhaps most importantly, someone to yell at 
uh, when things go wrong. Uh, and so we've been growing like back, uh, growing uh, by leaps and bounds since 2015. I uh, now employ lots of key contributors to both Julia itself, the language itself, uh, as well as the open source ecosystem, as well as, you know, uh, we now have a whole team working on all of these architectural types, getting, you know, HPC uh, compute going uh, as, as effectively as possible and helping folks run at scale. Uh, you can see lots of the, the logos there. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're working with five of the top 10 pharmaceuticals. I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to keep improving there. Uh, we see this as the future, uh, not just for pharmaceuticals, uh, not just for QSP, but, but across the board. Uh, it's just a great language for technical computing as well as general purpose computing and, and can be kind of your one-stop shop uh, to make this work as, as well as possible. Um, we also have services for training and learning, trying to help you get up to speed as quickly as possible. If you're coming from Python R or MATLAB, it's a pretty easy leap. Uh, it's not too bad to, to get going with Julia. Uh, largely because we've, you know, adopted many ideas from each of those languages, kind of taken the best of what's out there, uh, combined it all in a way that's that's fast and efficient, um, and making sure that we have the the training and the ability to do that. So, with that said, why don't we jump over to the Q and A session at this point? Uh, thanks all for your attention, and I'm happy to stick around to answer all all the questions that you have. So. To start off, uh, there is a question about um, pre-compilation. So one of the ways that Julia works, or in fact, the key way that Julia works is that it compiles your code for you. So if we jump back to the one bit of Julia code that I showed here, this Gillespie simulation, and we have this function that we just call f here, right? It's uh, just a arbitrary function. And we don't have any types here, right? We've not said what any of these SIR things are. We've not said what beta is. We've not said what gamma is. Um, and then we're just doing arithmetic with those things, right? And so uh, what Julia does is the first time that you call this function f, it'll inspect, it'll see what arguments are being called with it. You know, what is S, what is I, what is R, what are beta and gamma, what types are these things? And it'll compile a specialized version of this code. So for example, if these are 64 bit floating point numbers, kind of the standard floating point number, uh, it'll use you know, that hardware within your computer and compile down to you know, just a handful of statements here, a handful of multiplies and adds subtracts that use the efficient code within your, um, within your computer, you know, makes it very, very simple and easy to do uh, and, and does it as efficient as possible. This ends up being as efficient as the C code that would do exactly the same thing um, and compiles down to exactly the same. What that means, though, is that you know every time you call f with a new argument type. So if I were to call it with integers instead of floating point numbers, well then I would use integer arithmetic instead of floating point arithmetic. Or with complex numbers, uh, you'd use complex arithmetic. Um, or even with arrays or anything, you know that doesn't make sense in this context, but it's entirely possible. Um, you could do that, and Julia will will compile a specialized implementation for it. Uh, and this this compilation time is called precompile time, or uh, you know can can in effect be a little bit of a slowdown the first time you run something. The second time, though, Julia saves that compiled work, and you have that that very fast, efficient thing at your fingertips, ready to go, uh, very quickly. So. One of the problems that this has incurred within Julia itself has been, you know, the time it takes to do something immediately after starting Julia can be a long time. And one of the worst offenders here historically has been plotting. Uh, and so this has been known as the time to first plot problem, uh, where historically, you know, as recent as maybe two years ago, it would take upwards of 30 to 40 seconds to plot the very first plot that you have. And the next plot will be done within 30 to 40 milliseconds, right? It, it takes less than a second to, to do and is, is effectively instantaneous. But it, compiling all the plotting infrastructure and such has taken traditionally a long time. We've done lots of work on this uh, through the Julia team. 
the Julia computing team, as well as within the open source ecosystem, trying to get a handle on this, trying to improve this. And in fact, we've now shaved that down to less than five seconds on your first plot. And that doesn't just apply to, to plotting as uh, alone, that applies to all sorts of things. Uh, and so tackling this, this pre-compilation time problem has been a multifaceted approach that's kind of shaved things down significantly. Uh, and so, um, that's one way that we've improved it. The other way that we're working on improving it is just by making it easier to pre-build binaries out of Julia, kind of like a traditional, you know, the way you would work with C or Fortran where you have a compiler and you compile it and then you have an executable, right? Uh, instead of having text that, that gets run, you have an executable that's kind of a machine native uh, binary that, that the machine knows how to work with. Uh, and so we're also working on that. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because you need to know ahead of time, hey, S, I, and R are going to be floating point numbers. Let's pre-compile this F function for floating point numbers, right? There's nothing in this that's explicitly saying that this will work with floating point numbers until Julia happens to run across it and then it would compile it. But that would give you a, that little uh, hiccup or that little uh, you know, in this case, it would probably only take 100 milliseconds to compile this function. It's very small and, and short, uh, but you have enough of them and that starts adding up. Uh, and so we also allow you to pre-compile it uh, using a tool called Package Compiler, uh, and we're working on making that easier as well. So those, those are my recommendations. First and foremost, update to the most recent Julia. Uh, Julia 1.5 is, is significantly better and the upcoming release 1.6 will be better yet. Uh, the, the second point would be to use package compiler and, and get those compiled binaries as well, if that's still a, a, a bottleneck for you. But I've found that it's not nearly as much of a bottleneck, particularly if you use long running sessions that would be more familiar to say MATLAB, right? MATLAB, you're used to, to spinning up the IDE and just having MATLAB running. You can do exactly the same thing with Julia. Uh, then a few other questions here. Um, is there a graphical environment for QSP biological modeling or one in planning and development? There is not yet, uh, but it is firmly on the roadmap and is something that we have uh, our team working on and, and building up. But what we're working on first is making the nuts and bolts work as best as possible uh, for, for QSP and then work on the GUI secondarily. Um, and so as of right now, we don't yet have the, the graphical environment set up but uh, hoping to, we have a few grants that, that are leading that way and, and working that way that are funding some of that work as well as some of the academic work out of the Julia lab. So there's lots of groups working on this that are, are working on the visual GUI version of things. Uh, we are also working on the ability to import uh, graphical models from other systems. Uh, and so, you know, making the tools to read those graphical models so make it as easy as possible for you to translate into Julia. So then there's a question about, you know, this slide here. So why is Julia faster? Why is, is you know, Julia able to do this 220 times faster than R? Why is, you know, like, why can we get up to 500 times faster than R? The short answer is that compilation step. Uh, R is itself a compiled or an interpreted language. Um, and so that means that if you ever write a for loop within an R, R program, at every step of that for loop, in each iteration, R has to ask, hey, what is this thing? Uh, so for example, if you had a for loop here that's you know looping over this function uh, that is, um, you know, doing this within an, an interpreted environment akin to R or Python or something like that, it doesn't know even after be getting entering this function what beta S and I are. Uh, and so before doing this multiplication, it needs to ask what is S, what is I, and then how do I multiply them? Where is that multiplication function stored? Let me jump out to that multiplication function, do that multiplication function, come back, and then okay, I have another multiplication function. Uh, against this beta and you know what is this beta it's asking all these sorts of kind of meta questions uh, about what is the types of things right what are these types what how do I work with them how do I do even basic arithmetic uh, it needs to ask what is the code that does basic arithmetic 
Whereas Julia, what's happening here is, you know, we are uh, ahead of time, just barely ahead of time, seeing what the arguments are here, seeing that they're all floating point numbers. And then within this entire function body, we can compile this with that knowledge ahead of time. So no longer do you need to ask, hey, is this beta a floating point number? We know that statically. We know exactly what that is. And so we can just use straightforward floating point arithmetic that's built into our processors that can do the fast thing. And so it's that overhead that Julia is completely eliminating. And that's how, for example, for loops are fast. That's how, you know, user built functions are fast. It's how you're, you're kind of able to do this. Uh, there's a lot more details here. Uh, if, if you're interested, we can always dive in more. I, I, I enjoy this quite a bit. Um, but the key is, is that, you know, Julia was built from the ground up to be a fast technical language. Um, whereas Python was kind of built as a, as a pseudocode that folks found, hey, this works really well uh, for a technical language and, and added on parts. Um, and same thing with R as well. So there's that kind of tension. Um, I think that that probably is the the high level explanation. I'm happy to go deeper if you're curious. Um, but yes, it's entirely written in Julia itself, um, and the differential equation stack is entirely written in Julia itself. It's uh, that's kind of the power here is that there's nothing special uh, about Julia's innards. In fact, most of Julia is written in itself, and so. We have to have the language itself be fast um, uh, because otherwise, you know, anything, everything would be slow. Um, so that's, that's some kind of scratches the surface. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, and so then, you know, you you mention LM something. I think you're you're referring to uh, the compiler technology that we use. the The compiler technology is called LLVM. Uh, it stands for Low Level Virtual Machine, and it's kind of this intermediate step between you know the high level code and the the machine code. Um, and kind of importantly, it's the same compiler architecture that Apple and Google use for their their um, for for their languages. And so we're able to stand on top of their shoulders and, and use the kind of the best in class compiler technology that's out there uh, and make sure that, that, that it's fast. Uh, so yes, LLVM is part of the magic here that's hidden in the stack. But you know, Julia itself is coded in Julia, it just gets compiled along the way. With that, we're reaching the end of the hour. Any last quick questions here? Uh, apparently I missed a question on Flux. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, when we train a model, is there a way to visualize what's going on during the training so we can get some insights? Uh, to figure out, you know, what you do. The kind of the answer there um, is that that's a big open question. <laughs> um, you know, across just machine learning research in general, uh, what individual nodes of a network are doing is, is a hard problem. And, and in general, this is where the, the scientific ML approach really shines. Um, because what it allows you to do is, I should have a slide up for this, I don't have it on, on hand here. Um, what it allows you to do is it allows you to um, grab a particular aspect of your, here we go. It allows you to grab a particular aspect of your differential equations. Uh, and so it allows you to, to take, say, one coefficient within a very complicated differential equation system and replace it with a small machine learning network, a small deep neural network. Uh, and in some cases, you don't even need a deep neural network. A single layer could do just fine. A simple linear uh, model can work just fine. Um, but by, by reducing the size of your machine learning models by wrapping around them with the 
overall structure that you do understand. So, you know, in many biological cases, we know a lot of the, the differential equations. We know a lot of the terms. We've figured out exactly what those terms are, but some of them are still a mystery, right? And so instead of using an absurdly large neural network that uh, is very deep and is trying to represent all aspects of your of your system, you can just replace some coefficients with neural networks. And because these things are just functions, functions that happen to have tunable parameters, that Flux, which is Julia's machine learning framework, Flux knows how to optimize, knows how to train, knows how to use existing data to fit their, their coefficients, take the gradients with respect to not just the, the the neural network aspect, but the entire suite of differential equations and the entire integration of the differential equations, the entire solution, and can figure out how to optimize uh, potentially many of these, uh, these neural networks simultaneously, and each one can be smaller. And now you can gain an intuition of what each aspect is doing because you've split apart your neural networks Instead of having one absurdly large neural network that you're, is a huge black box, you have you know, four smaller black boxes that you know what they're doing, right? You know what aspect of the system they're, they're representing. Uh, you know, in, in this case, it's the, in the top row here, it's representing that RA out parameter and it's changing the, the derivative there in some way. And then you can inspect the inputs and the output and gain a feel for what it's doing. And, and in some cases, you can even totally back propagate out you know, the mathematical form, the closed form solution based upon the behavior of the neural network at large. Uh, and that's only possible because it's a small neural network. And that's only possible because you've represented the rest of the system with your own knowledge of the system. So this is a really, really cool next way of, of moving towards the next generation of QSP. Uh, and it's a really great way of, of ending this, this talk. Thank you for, for bringing this up. I should have included this slide in, in my deck uh, uh, itself. But uh, this is a, a great example of how you can, can gain a better understanding of what neural networks are doing. Oh, maybe do I have a uh, typo? Someone is having difficulty finding the Gillespie.jl. Uh, uh, and yeah, we can just jump out to the internet here. Let me grab. Um, so the one place for SciML to go is what is called SciML.ai here. Uh, you can, let's make this a little bit bigger. So SciML.ai is the entry place for this. There's lots of examples. You can go into this showcase. There's uh, lots of ways of understanding exactly how this is working. Uh, and it's scaling the whole way from, from things like Pumas uh, to things like QSP to things like uh, the Climate Modeling Alliance, which is trying to build the largest yet model of the entire Earth's climate, uh, which is a really cool project. Um, but this is a good way of gaining an understanding. For Gillespie.jl, um, the reference here. Uh, again, the easiest way to pull this up is just to search for Gillespie.jl. And here we have the JOS paper. So I don't know if this DOI, is that the same DOI? Do I have a typo? So I've just copied and pasted it in here. Um, looks like that's the same. I don't know why that's not working, but uh, Hopefully with those two questions, I know we're a little bit over time, but thank you all for your attention and thanks for your great, great questions and hope to see you around either in the SciML community or the differential equations community or, or the Julie itself. Uh, thanks for your participation. All right, take care everyone. Oh, I see, I uh, dropped a one. Uh, yeah, 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 the 10 is missing. Thank you. I'll fix that. Nice. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.